we are in the market of trying to influence nudge shift behavior and i think you know the harsh reality is that people will not en masse move to plant-based overnight and so the idea is okay how can we make this something as sonia said that everybody can do Welcome to Facing Future TV. I am your co-host, Raya Salter, here with Dale Walkinen. Today, we are pleased to be in conversation with UK-based Sonia Lachman and Amy Higgins, founders of Every One of Us, an organization creating everyday climate heroes with its flagship project, Couch to Carbon Zero. Couch to Carbon Zero is a platform that empowers people through popular education to take everyday climate action and understand how they can make a difference. Welcome, Amy and Sonia, to Facing Future. Hi, thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Hi, we're happy to have you. We loved the little videos you sent us, under five minutes each, and you have 10 of them. Maybe we'll start with your video about the oceans, which we found incredibly a summary of sea spiracy, beautifully done, um, the problem with overfishing. Thanks. Um, yeah, it was quite a tricky one to research, actually, because there is just so much going on in the oceans and there are so many causes to the troubles that we're now seeing. So, you know, as we say in the video, when you look out to the ocean and to the sea, it looks like it's fine. But of course, we don't see beneath the surface and all these sort of horrors that are happening there in terms of the decimation of marine life, coral reefs, and really the foundation of everything which keeps us all alive and well and our whole precious ecosystem in balance. So it was a super important topic for us to include in the 10 days when we were thinking about the things that we wanted to include. You know, it's like the biggest carbon sink that we have, the oceans. It provides up to 80% of our oxygen. Like we have to have a vibrant, living, healthy ocean for all of us, including, of course, all the creatures within it. And when you think about what's the problem that's happening and what are causing those problems, industrial fishing was really the top issue. Um, of course, we've got the, the general heating of the ocean the acidification of the ocean, it being filled with plastics. There are lots of problems, but we decided to zone in on industrial fishing because it's just got insane and it's destroying the life in oceans and in many cases, needlessly. So what we found was that really there are three things kind of going on in the oceans. One is the scale. Like we catch 2.7 trillion fish a year from the ocean when you watch the footage of the amount of fish that that is, I mean, you just think, well, of course, nature can't replenish, you know, at that rate, this is unbelievable amounts of fish. And then the second issue, which is, I find the most heartbreaking, is that there's loads of bycatch. Mm -hmm. So there's loads of fish that's being caught without us even wanting them. So we're killing them or harming them and then tossing them back into the sea or they die on the shore. You know, what a complete and utter waste of precious life and it's done no good for anybody for that to happen and then finally you've got the catching methods that are used when when you're out fishing and of course we've seen all these massive boats and you know when they're out the high seas who knows what methods are being used it's incredibly hard to police there's over four million boats out there and bottom trawling so scraping the ocean floor with big nets trying to catch these big hauls are disturbing all of the carbon that's on the base but also disturbing all of the habitats yeah. for the fish so in in aggregate and that's not to mention all the plastic from the fishing nets and all the waste that you know that brings it's it's just got massively out of hand so one of the things that we were quite surprised to learn, but also gave us some hope, is that we've only got to leave 30% of the oceans alone for them to recover. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, surely between us, we can yeah. leave 30% of the oceans alone. I mean, come on. But I don't know if you've seen marine protected areas. You look mm -hmm. into to these areas where it is deemed to be protected, but actually not all marine protected areas are have exclusions for fishing. 
So it's like, okay, those protections aren't enough. Like we need more of this to be protected. And, you know, some brilliant work going on. There are hope spots happening around the world where they are fully protected and the life's coming back. So you can see that it's like possible, but we, you know, we all have to play our our part in that. So um, when we were thinking about, okay, well, as individuals, of course, we can't be out on on boats unless we volunteer for brilliant organizations like Sea Shepherd, who will go and police what is actually (laughs) happening out there. What are the things that we can do in our everyday life? And the main thing that we said is, okay, well, if 30% of the oceans need to be protected, then why don't we reduce our fish consumption by at least 30%? And I say in the video, well, the maths is a bit tricky. So why don't we just go for 50%? So if you're having fish twice a week, you know, perhaps you can have it once a week. And of course, you know, if you can give it up altogether for a while, whilst all of this recovers, all the better. And there are some brilliant, you know, plant-based alternatives to fish coming out and you can still get your omega-3s and you don't need to worry. Fish are just the middlemen in that situation. So, you know, there are some good positive things that we can do. And then if and when we do eat fish, it's then looking at, well, what fish are better to eat than others? So you're looking at things like, you know, where people on packaging say, this has been responsibly sourced. It's like, okay, but has it been responsibly caught? Are you trawling the bottom of the ocean? And in the UK, there's a really good guide called the Good Fish Guide where you can have a look at the fish that you're looking to get, and it will tell you whether that is a a green, amber, or red choice. So it's a really handy in-your-pocket guide when you're you're out and about. And we give some examples of some of the swaps. So please don't eat prawns. We've got to protect those mangroves. Um, You know, perhaps swap for mussels, for example. So that's mainly what we cover, but it was... uh, Incredibly difficult to get to the heart of all of that. Um, and I don't think it's made easy for us necessarily. So having things like the Good Fish Guide is is really helpful. Well, it's amazing that you put all that in five minutes in, in your <laughs> presentation. Um, and you even dealt with the fish farming myth that that's a great thing to do because it is, it isn't, of course, yeah. is the fish. It's, it's another industrial agriculture thing, the fish farming. You know, I used to think, wow, eating fish is so great. But Actually, you know, a a lot of poisons now in the oceans, there's a lot of mercury, there's a lot of plastic. And as you know, it's it's the fishing nets that are the majority of the plastic waste. But, you know, your presentation was spot on. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks very much. Yeah, it was a real shame to learn about farm fishing because, you know, we've got these farms. And so that means we're not depleting these wild stocks and it means we're not trawling the ocean floor. So I was getting all quite excited that might be the answer only for that excitement to be dashed by for the very reasons that you say you know it's massively overcrowded they are being sprayed with chemicals you can have accidents where hundreds of thousands then escape breed with the wild fish so now we're reducing the gene pool um, as a whole and it's it's a real shame. And, and to your point, um, you know, I am not fully plant based and I was eating fish as well. And actually the health aspects um, sort of weigh as equally for me as the planet aspects from what I learned. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was quite shocking. It, it brings us to the other another video you did on plants. I, you, you, were, you pointed out, you know, we're not going to use the V word. <laughs> <laughs> why vegan is a dirty word but it's true people do take a lot of effect from being asked to be vegans oh my god i can't eat animal products but you know you did you did look at the billions of animals that are raised uh in the world and and the land use that mm-hmm. is going to creating feed for those animals or grazing those animals is is really destructive yeah, I mean it's it's absolutely it's absolutely massive as as we all know. But I mean we we were very intentional in in saying look, you don't have to be a vegan to make a contribution here. Because I mean everyone just kicks off, don't they? It's like, oh my god, this is such it's such a divisive issue. And yeah. our big thing is look, this is not about perfection. If we're going to bring our planet back to life, we're not going to do it by perfection. You know, so how how can we do this in a way that we can all contribute, but that's not demanding people to demanding too much of people or too much of a shift, perhaps, from where they are. Um, So, yeah, we really wanted to talk to scale a bit like Amy, you know, as Amy was just saying, you know, if fishing was done in the way that it was done years ago um, without a population of nine billion people on the planet, 
it's a whole different story and we're not talking about that destruction in the same way. Um, but when you look at farming the way it is now, I mean, we give the example in the video of in the 1950s, the average chicken consumption was one kilo a year. So it was a massive, massive treat, you know, that everyone looked forward to. Now, of course, it's 28 kilos. So it's literally gone up 28 times. And that's not counting pork, lamb, beef. You know, so when, when you start to multiply that, it's shockingly colossal. Um, and it's absolutely commonplace now for people even to have three meat meals a day. I found it so interesting in that video. And again, your videos are, are so compelling and interesting. Um, and there's so much that folks just don't know. And I noticed in one of the videos, you talked about that here in the UK, we have US style factory farms, and that's something that's growing. Do you feel like there's a sense in the UK that people have this myth that things you know, are somehow better or different because there are these various labels and that, you know, this is something that's help happening elsewhere? Or why did you emphasize that point? I think there's a big thing that's missed in this whole picture. You know, so not only is factory farming absolutely devastating for the planet, it's unconscionable in terms of what we actually put these animals through. And I think both parts of that argument are massively important. If we don't look after the creatures on earth, we are going to pay the we are going to pay the price for that. What's really interesting is that in terms of animal welfare, the UK is one of the highest welfare countries in the world, mm -hmm. and we're traditionally considered a nation of animal lovers. I think most people would be absolutely shocked to find out that um, seventy that in the UK seventy three percent of animals are factory farmed. I think that would absolutely stagger people. So I think you're absolutely right that we have such comforting labels, farm fresh, pictures of happy cows roaming around fields. I think that if people genuinely knew the truth behind that, you know, like we said in the video, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, we wouldn't mm. be having this conversation because people mm. would be absolutely shocked. So that was one of the... Um, the really important points that we wanted to make. And as we all know, and I'm sure your very erudite audience will know too, you know, is that when you're doing it at that scale, the, the effects are absolutely devastating to pretty much every system on the planet, you know? So whether we're going to deforestation, degradation of our soils, killing our oceans and our rivers because of fertilizer and pesticide runoff, I mean, what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico with those colossal algae blooms, that is as a direct result of nitrogen fertilizers flowing through from the, from the rivers into the oceans. We've got it linked to pandemics, of course. You know, we've got it linked to huge health problems. We've got it linked to antibiotic resistance. So, you know, when you look at the, the whole picture, much beyond climate change, because I think this, this particular narrative tends to stay in the methane argument. Yeah. Mm. Cows are burping. So this is bad news, guys. We've got to stop this. Whereas I think that, again, it's one of those things that we only really, a bit like Amy was saying, the fish, and you only see the tip of the iceberg. Most people wouldn't think about fish on all those levels. And I think, you know, when we know this stuff, who wants to harm the planet? Nobody, you know, so it's like, okay, the more that we know this, the more we can make those decisions from a, from a place of true consciousness. One thing you noted I, in your presentation was the, 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 the labels on, on food, but free range in this country is different from cage free. So it's, it's all very tricky, but, you know, surely eating less animal products or no animal products is definitely going to help the planet. 100%. I mean, if we all just cut out two days a week, can you imagine the absolute difference it would make? And if at the same time we bought better, so we bought animals who hadn't been through a factory system, who were truly free range. So in, in, in England, the free range standard is that it can actually take up to 16,000 birds in a, in a shed so long as they've got access to the outdoors. So what we mm. really push here is organic, you know, so that actually birds are outdoors and they are getting good nutrition themselves, which of course then means healthier food for the people who are eating it.
The organic means that they are outdoors? There's lots of different organic standards. So um, if you look at classic free range, the, the basic standard is, look, it can't be a flock of more than 16,000 and they have to have access to the outdoors. The reality is that's the equivalent of being at a huge concert, say Wembley Stadium, and you're trying to get to the loo. You're just never going to make it to the door. <laughs> With organic, there's a whole other set of standards. So you have a much lower flock size, but it also hits on obviously feed, non-GM, etc. So again, it's it's not a system in isolation. It also affects the land around it, and you know it's all part of a system. You broke it down in such a, and to me, in such a delightful way in that you, you give the information and then you kind of provide a guide to the labels. It's mm -hmm. right there. And as you know, folks can, I guess, are seeing this at the grocery store and they're, you're giving them a guide to sort of what to look at. What's been the reaction from folks about this? Has, have they found it helpful? Is it empowering them to make different choices? Definitely. I think a lot of people are finding it quite joyful in, 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 in a sense of, okay, this is giving me freedom and actually it's really equipping me to make the right decisions. Because I think there's a lot of, this is the stuff we shouldn't do for these reasons. But there's not much out there going, this is exactly how you do the right things, guys. This is mm -hmm. exactly what you look for. This is where to get it. What a relief. You go into <laughs> great, I'll, great, I'll go and do that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of alternatives now to to meat. Um, there's some really great tuna fish that's not tuna fish. There's beef products that are not beef, uh, etc. I think telling people, okay, you can do it part way and that's fine, is uh, not the way I would go. <laughs> but you know, I know that's that's the way your program is working. I I just sort of say to people, okay, it's your planet. You know, it's not up to me. It's your choice. I'm not. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's important to flag and I'll do it on your behalf. Sonia. Sonia is a um, absolute committed animal protector. And this was a really hard video to do because of course we're in the market of trying to influence nudge shift behavior. And I think, you know, the harsh reality is that people will not en masse move to plant base overnight. And so the idea is, okay, how can we make this something, as Sonia said, that everybody can do? You know, everyone can, can play a part. And, you know, as someone who used to eat meat and, and don't anymore, one of the things that we did in the video is we accompany it with cheat sheets and we included, you know, here's where you can find brilliant plant-based recipes. Because I remember when I first gave up meat, I was like, I don't know what to cook. I've got no idea, like, what to cook. And I'm still learning now, and this is three years on. I was going to no, say, go basically, on. I had to cook for Amy every time she came over for about two years. <laughs> it's quite a good trick, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, just, another thing I'd like to spend some time with is, is the great videos you did on renewables and gadgets. The incredible number of smartphones that now exist in the world and, you know, where are those going? You know, we have to look at where does everything come from? Whatever you buy, what, what was the cost to the earth to make that thing? Do you really need that thing? Because that's going to do this to everything we have is going to have some impact. So e-waste is <laughs> stunning in its um, scale. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the, the stat that we were shocked by is that the waste every year is equivalent to the weight of all commercial planes ever built. It's like, <laughs> what? Like, are you joking? And I mean, I love a gadget. So this was also a very painful one to, to find out about. Um, I, I'm always, you know, up for the latest Apple whatever. Um, and yeah, in the UK, it's deemed that we've got about 10 connected devices per household. And I don't know how that sort of stacks up for you both. But when we were doing our own mental audit, it's like, okay, I've got my laptop, I've got my mobile phone, you know, have I got a tablet? Have I got this, that and the other games, consoles, etc. cetera. Um, and I think, you know, the key message that we were trying to get across um, from what we learned was there are a finite amount of minerals in the earth that we are digging up, sometimes under terrible conditions, which are exploiting families, children, et cetera, putting them at risk and under huge amounts of pressure to dig these things up for us to have the latest shiny thing. But of course, these are the minerals that we need for our green future. So we need it for our solar panels, electric vehicles, and all the green tech that is going to transition us away from 
fossil fuels. And if we're using all of these minerals for our gadgets, which we're starting to treat as disposable, you know, we're just going to have something for a year or two and then upgrade to the next and to the next. You know, what is happening with those minerals? We need to keep them in circulation. This can't be something that ends up in landfill or the back of a drawer. And it's said that, you know, at least in the UK, we've got one or two phones lingering about in our drawers. There's about 31 million devices just sat about in our house. So it's like, okay, what what can we do? Well, you know, one of the things we can do is keep our devices for longer. You know, 80% of the emissions from gadgets and their environmental impact come from production. So if we can stop that production cycle being so rapid, that will save a lot for the planet. But similarly then, okay, when we do get rid of it, how can we then give that a second life? So there are some brilliant programs um, in the UK. Um, O2 and Hubbub have created one here, which enables devices to be sort of wiped clean, refurbished, and then put together with a data package and given to those most in need. Um, And that's like a wonderful way to give your device a, a second life. Um, And also then if you're then going to replace that, you know, here are the places where you can buy refurbished phones that come with guarantees. And one of the places that we found called Music Magpie in the UK, they have uh, rental options, which I love because I love a gadget and I love to, you know, upgrade and, and be delighted by new things. Having a rental option means actually I can do that each 12 months, but it's always a refurbished gadget. I'm not putting an extra demand on the planet by by doing that. Um, but it's it's strange to think that our devices are really treasure and they're holding all of this treasure and that is how we should treat them versus just disposable items. Well, all mining is destructive. Mining is inherently a, a destructive process. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the the the, the we're we're gonna also talk about renewables here because you know, we think, oh, wonderful renewable energy, it's going to be great. But actually, a huge amount of fossil fuels go into the production of renewables. Recycling also takes a huge amount of energy. So, you know, people think, oh, that's great. It's just recycled. We, we you don't have to check that, you know, but it doesn't quite work that way. We really need fewer and mm. or, uh, devices. Um, and we need to really look at where does each product come from? What did that impact how did that impact the earth? And where is it going at the end? This yeah. thing, you know, how will that be reabsorbed by nature? Can it be reabsorbed by nature? Uh, as, as so much of our culture, definitely in the United States, and you could maybe speak to the UK, I suspect it's the same, is about having. Having, mm. you know, it's like having is equated with um, social status. Having, you know, having the latest thing um, means that you are good enough. And it just, there's, do you think that, you know, you're doing this popular education, can we begin to shift these cultural norms towards reuse, you know, this refurbishment? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as Sonia said, you know, if we went back to how we were living in the 50s, you know, it was a lot less, but then that's when advertising and marketing started, right? Yeah. And so that's when all of this push for an aspirational lifestyle. I mean, no one had had an aspirational lifestyle really before then. And now you're being shown, well, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. This is what a brilliant life looks like. And if you don't have all of these shiny things, whether that's clothes or cars or jewelry or whatever, all of these things which are taking resources from the earth then you know you're not you're not one of the cool kids and of course we always wanted to be one of the cool kids so now we're going to buy all of this stuff which quite frankly makes us broken not that much happier so you know it's going to be such a huge cultural change and I think it's funny because when we talk to a lot of companies and organizations who we support with this stuff we say you know this doesn't have to be a mission to less But it could be like more in terms of more connection, more nutritious food, you know, a a greater sense of well-being because you're looking after yourself, your loved ones and the planet. Mm -hmm. And deprivation makes Mm -hmm. it feel like I don't want to do that. You know, it's over there. But actually, it's really rewarding when you do these sorts of things and you get to engage in this way. Your life feels fuller. Um, So it's that's the mission that we would love to to share. It's kind of quite exciting right now because, you know, to, to your point of cool kids, Eamon, who doesn't want to be a cool kid, right? <laughs> I mean, it's starting to become seriously cool. I don't know whether you've got this show in the U.S. called Love Island. 
<laughs> I don't think we do, but I think we know about your your Love Island. Yes, it's a mega show, absolutely mega, and all the kids watch it, and it's all full of you know what do you call them supposed influencers you know wearing like a different outfit every day you know it's probably cost about two pounds I mean it's just a total environmental disaster and for the first time the whole thing is going to be on pre-loved clothes oh love island it's mega I mean that so they're putting a message out to people which is you want to be cool these guys are cool this is how you be cool. You wear you wear pre-loved clothing. It's huge. I mean, so, you know, it's starting to shift to the point. Maybe it'll get to the point where it's like smoking, you know, where mm. you think, oh, really, you still smoke? You know, every time you go shopping, really, you still go shopping? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love that. Well, it's been great to talk with you. Um, the 10-day sprint for busy people is... Uh, mostly centered right now in the UK, but I think you are maybe working on something for the United States. If you're not, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it's Thank very, it, very good. It covers so many things and in a, in a way that everybody can digest. And we're really grateful for you uh, doing that. What we really want people to realize is, because I think so many people feel really disempowered in this. They feel they can't make a difference. We want people to know that they've got a choice, they've got a voice, and they've got a wallet. And together we can really change the world. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.